here tonight, but uh, there is apparently a really chronic shortage and we haven't been able to engage anyone. So hopefully we will be able to for our May 2nd event. Uh, tonight's format after Dr. Ravin's talk, we're going to open up the floor uh, both here and for our live stream audience through chat uh, for Q&A and you'll come down to this mic here right behind Dr. Ravin. We do ask that everyone use the mic just because it will make it much, uh, uh, people will be able to hear here in the room and also uh, on the live stream. Um, we will end at 8 p.m. And I want to turn to just say thank you very much to our sponsors. We are really fortunate to, whoops, let's see. Un momento. We are really fortunate to have the support of all of these wonderful folks on the screen. And they're off again, so we'll just let them be. <laughs> Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont, Hickok and Boardman Insurance Group, the Stotts Brachus Group at Morgan Stanley, University of Vermont Medical Center, and Velco Vermont Electric Power Company. So thank you all very much. Um, so a few housekeeping announcements. Our arrangement with dealer.com is that we use the usher system to bring people into the theater and to also help people uh, get back out to the front. So if you need to leave early or even if you need to use the restroom, we will um, usher you around. And then after the talk, we'd appreciate your feedback. We have feedback forms in your folder and then our live stream, we will be sending a link immediately following. Uh, now, let's turn to our talk. Uh, it's my privilege to introduce my colleague and Howard Center's Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Simha Ravin. Dr. Ravin is an Assistant Clinical Professor in Law and Psychiatry at the Yale University School of Medicine, an Assistant Clinical Professor of Psychiatry at the University of Vermont, and past president of the Vermont Medical Society. She graduated from U of Iowa Carver College of Medicine and completed her residency in psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. She went on to train in forensic psychiatry at Yale University School of Medicine, where you continue to serve on the faculty. You're board certified in general adult and forensic psychiatry, and her passion is in caring for adults with serious mental illness and contributing to some of what we're gonna talk about tonight, research and policy on the intersection of law and mental health. Dr. Ravin has received numerous professional uh, honors. She's written extensively and presented extensively. She is a wonderful, you are a wonderful and approachable colleague and well known for your kindness, your compassion and your expertise. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Simha Ravin. I think it just needs to be woken up. I think this just has to be woken up. There, so. Okay, we're gonna. Go, we need to go over here. Okay. Simi, we're getting you situated here. Yeah. Slideshow. From beginning and you got it. thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Denise, for that wonderful introduction. I'm really excited to be here and to be kicking off the community education series. Um, I, I love the reminder that this is the first in-person one since 2019, and I feel especially lucky and honored to be talking to you today. Um, so I'll, I'll go ahead and, and get started. I have to live up to that wonderful introduction and, and thank you. Can you move the mic a little closer or just... Sure. Are you having trouble hearing me? Yeah, I'm not hearing any amplification. Okay. Is that better? A little bit. We can turn it up. Do I turn it up over here? Yeah. How is that? Can everybody hear me? <laughs> wonderful. All good? Okay, very good. Huh. Very good. So mental health is community health. Um, 
so I, I developed the title of this before I really developed the talk. So I will be talking about law and mental health in Vermont. But as I really thought about what was important to us, it wasn't so much a dry talk on Vermont mental health law, though that is important, and I promise I will go over some highlights of that. But what was really relevant, and I think really matters to um, the work that many of us do and the challenges that we see in our community is the context in which we apply um, mental health law in, in Vermont. So I'm gonna be talking more about can you hear me out there? Okay, very good. Um, about the, the human end of this, and um, I'll, I'll be talking um, about the, his, in, well, I'll, I'll, I'll get to it, and I'll, I'll tell you a little more as we go along. So Denise did a wonderful introduction. Um, I'm Dr. Simcha Raven. I'm Chief Medical Officer at Howard Center. And as she mentioned, I wear a number of different professional hats. Uh, I serve on faculty at uh, the Division of Law and Psychiatry at Yale School of Medicine, um, and I've done that, time goes very quickly, I've done that for 10 years now, um, and I serve on faculty at the University of Vermont Larner College of Medicine, and I'm a past president of the Vermont Medical Society. So this is what we'll be talking about today. Uh, I'll discuss a case uh, the story of an individual uh, at the, uh, who experiences homelessness and serious mental illness. I'll give a little bit of the history uh, in the United States of um, developments in mental health care and some scientific and legislative changes that have brought us to where we are. And then I will review Vermont mental health law and give some highlights on voluntary and involuntary psychiatric treatment and mandated community treatment. So I find that I learn best from narratives and I'm gonna actually share the story of a real person here. Um, this on the, sitting on the bed, that's a young man and his name is Andre Shevelyev. Um, if this looks familiar, it may be because you read the New York Times, and uh, this was a feature in the Times a few weeks ago, um, talking about this young man and his experiences, and I'll uh, detail that as we go along. Um, as I was thinking about what to talk about here tonight and how to illustrate some of the um, issues that we're dealing with as a community, I initially wanted to talk about individuals who are local, who live in Vermont um, and in Burlington, whom I know and have similar stories. But as you can imagine, it was really hard to do that and keep their privacy protected. Um, so I, I'm gonna share the story of Andre, whose story is in the public domain and was recently, fe excuse me, featured in the New York Times. And so this is Andre um, sitting cross-legged on the bed, and that's his mother, Olga. Um, as we go along, I'm gonna encourage you to think about the sometimes competing concerns of individual autonomy and individual living and treatment preferences and um, the sometimes competing concerns of community and, and individual safety. So if you, to keep that, those uh, themes in mind as we go along. So Andre is 31 years old. He experiences schizoaffective disorder and has hallucinations and delusions and sometimes experiences mood disturbances. His family doesn't live in Vermont. They live in the Pacific Northwest. And um, up until his mid-20s, um, from what Andre and his, his parents described, he could blend in with other kids. In high school, he was bright with a tight-knit group of friends who were all avid gamers like himself. And after he graduated, his parents hoped that he would go on to college for art or music, his interests. Both his parents worked as stagehands and had good union jobs, and Andre seemed eager to do the same. Um, but Andre started to experience symptoms of a psychotic disorder. His roommates 
kicked him out, and he then moved to the couch in uh, Sam and Olga, his stepfather and mother's one bed bedroom apartment in Vancouver. And he struggled at work. Um, at work, there were incidents, and he had what others saw as odd and threatening behavior that were, was upsetting to his coworkers. Uh, Sam and Olga became worried about him, and they uh, made an appointment for him to see a therapist. He said to the therapist, I feel like I'm driving my friends away. When, this was when he was 26, so some years later. I used to be able to talk to people. Now they're not interested. He told the therapist about a family tragedy um, a source of pain that he'd really tried not to think about for, for years. Um, when he was eight, he watched his twin sister, Sasha, drown in a duck pond in a neighbor's yard. The children were alone. He had tried to save her. And he said, I've thought about it to exhaustion. I've incorporated her into these stories I make up. His mother, Olga, agonized over his future, uh, but felt unsafe having him live with her. And then three years ago, when he stopped taking antipsychotic medication, um, Andre became uh, more troubled and withdrew into the delusional thoughts that were troubling him and um, had more what his parents described as unpredictable and frightening behavior. His parents were concerned that they might get evicted from their apartment, and Olga and her husband Sam sought a no-contact order to keep Andre away. So since then, he had lived in a tent, um, and we're in the Pacific Northwest, um, and in, near Vancouver, and he was seen wearing threadbare clothes and carrying a machete for protection. Twice he'd been in jail um, and voiced concerns, uh, worried concerns about the CIA. Three times he'd been involuntarily, psychiatrically hospitalized um, and uh, subject to physical restraints and forced involuntary medication. So this picture here was at a more hopeful moment. Now Olga and Andre are together at room 117 in a budget hotel overlooking the interstate. And the county had allotted a significant amount of funds, $8,400 to house him temporarily as part of an effort by the state to divert people who experienced serious mental illness away from the criminal justice system. And this was enough money to keep him at this uh, hotel for eight weeks. So these are really similar issues uh, that are challenging communities around the country and, and around affordable housing can be really difficult to access. Um, some people who experience serious mental illness may be reluctant to be housed or really have negative experiences in subsidized housing. Um, disruptive neighbors, uh, crime and substance use in housing can also make it unappealing or unsafe. And as, we, as many of us have experienced or many of us know, um, people who experience serious mental illness are often disproportionately shunted to the criminal justice system for what are often described as nuisance crimes, um, like public urination or disturbing the peace. Um, so back to Andre. We know that he's now temporarily housed. Um, this picture shows where he was camping. Um, and in this precious window of time, his mother would like to try to convince him to accept treatment and accept housing. What's next, she asked him. She had offered him clothes, a hot meal, books to read, but he didn't want those things. All he wanted was to sleep on her couch for a little while. I won't get in the way, he said. 
This was the problem, she told him. He scared people. At one point, convinced that she and Sam, his stepfather, were body doubles remote controlled by the CIA, he smashed the rear window of their car with a flagpole and, called and they had called 911. She said carefully to him, you sort of have an idea that your behavior was inappropriate. She told him carefully and, and then um, she gulped and said, some medications do help. You have that condition, that medical condition that has to be addressed. But Andre knew this was coming and he had an answer. He did not accept a uh, diagnosis of schizoaffective disorder um, and did not feel that his thoughts were delusional and felt strongly that if it were a choice between taking medication and living outside, he would choose to live outside. Still, he wanted to be near, his, near Olga, near his mom, and he looked for a compromise. There are a lot of forested areas outside where we live, he said. I could set up a tent. Set up a tent, Olga repeated dully. She was standing by the ironing board and she began to cry. So before the money ran out, um, Andre had, uh, had a choice to make or had to make a choice both. Would he accept that he needed treatment and have housing that was contingent upon that as his parents hoped he would and move into a group home would he go back to living in a tent, or was there another way, another option for him? Um, I'm going to take a step back here and say, like, how did we get to this place? And how did we get to a place where many people who experience uh, serious mental illness have these kinds of challenges with um, housing um, and uh, basic support like, like Andre? Um, I'm going to go back actually quite a ways and show uh, a brief video about the beginning of the asylum movement in the mid-19th century. Um, just a, a word of warning, the brief film I show uses language that was acceptable at that time that we might feel, uh, you know, find really antiquated or offensive. Um, so a, a, a note before, before we get to that. I tell what I have seen. these women committed. They are lunatics. Why is there no stove to warm them? They said the insane do not feel heat or cold. Ms. Dix secures a court order to provide heat for the prisoners. state to observe treatment of the mentally ill. She finds cruel conditions. She keeps careful notes and petitions the state legislature. Since women are not allowed to speak in the legislature, she asks a sympathetic doctor to deliver her report. Chained, naked, beaten with rods, and lashed into disobedience. I don't know if the face palm is historically accurate. Painful and shocking as the details often are, 
to prevent a repetition or continuance of such outrages. No. They agree to fund a state hospital for the mentally ill. She travels the country investigating conditions and reporting abuses. I appear as the advocate of those who cannot plead their own cause, she wrote. I come as the friend of those who are deserted, oppressed, and desolate. With her help, 32 state hospitals are founded to care for the mentally ill. Very good. So the first psychiatric hospital was actually established in 1773, but asylums were few and far between until the mid-1800s. And this brief uh, film strip told the story of Dorothea Dix, who advocated um, for these asylums and these kinds of hospitals. And um, I'll talk a little bit about that in, in Vermont and what has happened uh, since then. We don't want to play it again. I just want to advance the slide. OK. No. Oh, I can just, there we are. Did that work? Uh, there we are. Um, so uh, Dorothy Dix started lobbying states to create asylums and eventually helped establish or, exam or expand more than 30 institutions. Um, many more were created in the decades that followed. And I found this uh, figure astonishing. By the height of institutionalization in the mid-50s, roughly half a million people were living in state-run psychiatric facilities. And this slide shows the Dorothea Dix Hospital in New Jersey. Um, and the Vermont Asylum for the Insane was founded in 1834. Um, now, that is now known as the Brattleboro Retreat. And that's actually the first facility for the care of people who experience mental illness uh, founded in Vermont and one of the first 10 private psychiatric hospitals in the US. Uh, this is an historic picture of the Brattleboro Retreat. And the initial intent and design was um, to be a safe therapeutic place where people who experience mental illness could live quality and productive lives. Um, and, and sometimes they succeeded in doing this. Um, some self-sufficient asylum communities provided employment and sustenance for residents, uh, small-scale agricultural production, laundries, and bakeries. Um, but as more uh, people were moved into the institutions, they quickly outgrew their capacity, and staff struggled to keep up with patients' needs. Um, I, I think it's worthwhile to note, too, that what was categorized at that time as mental illness is very different than what we sort of define in that way today. Um, so when a public psychiatric hospital in Worcester, Massachusetts opened in 1833, for example, it had room for 120 people. And just 13 years later, it had almost 400 people living there. The problem grew significantly worse during World War II, when many doctors and other staff were drafted, leaving hospitals really dangerously understaffed. So from uh, well-intentioned and bucolic beginnings um, to very tenuous and uh, dangerous and, and crowded situations. I'm going to share one more slide of those um, bucolic intent. This is from the Brattleboro Retreat. This is the retreat farm. Um, this is now a separate uh, nonprofit organization, but it was built as a working farm to support the um, patients and staff 
at the Brattleboro retreat. And it's, uh, this is the contemporary um, organization, um, but you can see the dairy farm and creamery um, uh, that once supported the hospital and its community. It was essentially like a self-contained village. This may look familiar to some of you. This is the Vermont State Hospital in Waterbury. And that was built in 1890 to alleviate overcrowding at the Vermont Asylum um, or the Brattleboro Retreat. Um, so, uh, and then the retreat's name was changed to distinguish it um, from the Vermont State Hospital because they were so similar in name. And the resulting conditions of the overcrowding that I described look remarkably similar to those seen in contemporary jails and prisons. Um, this is a, an historical picture, I think mid 20th century of a hospital. Um, and I'll point out that I think for privacy, people's faces are, are whited out for privacy. Um, and this was a, you know, arguably the beginning of the end for the state hospital system. system. Um, but factors other than overcrowding sort of um, sped that up. That's a contemporary prison, and you can see the parallels there. That's another image of a hospital, a mid 20th century hospital, and another image of a, a contemporary prison. Um, I'm going to show a section of this documentary. It's a PBS documentary that gives a really good overview of major scientific, legislative, and social contributors to mental health care in the last century. Um, and I will, I'm just going to show an excerpt of that. So, yeah, so they're talking here about the production and um, development of Thorazine, the first antipsychotic medication. And one of the most hopeful contributions of that research is new drugs. All of the drugs in psychiatry were discovered serendipitously by accidental, clever clinical observation. This is me when I came to the hospital. I was very upset from many worries. What did the voices say to you, Sally? Thorazine, the first antipsychotic, was discovered because it was being used by surgeons as an anti-emetic so people wouldn't throw up during operations. And it calmed the patients down. This is me after the doctor gave me some medicine to help me. And you were telling me there was something wrong in the neighborhood, is that right? Now I'm not so mixed up. I talked to him, okay. There's no question that in the scope of history, when it comes to understanding mental illness, the real turning point came with the introduction of Thorazine. The effects of these drugs on Sally and patients like her led scientists to a new theory that antipsychotics alter levels of a chemical in the brain called dopamine. Dopamine was one of dozens of neurotransmitters discovered over time. In identifying these, seeing what parts of the brain those were operative in, we developed drugs and used them to treat various types of neuropsychiatric conditions. To this day, how exactly changes in brain chemistry lead to changes in thought and behavior remains unknown. But in the 1950s, antipsychotics let asylums do the unthinkable, send patients home. What's the difference? I feel like uh, I talk just to myself. I don't feel like talking to nobody else, just to myself. Patients who were hitherto unmanageable or untreatable 
or who had resisted all other forms of treatment now have been helped. I am very happy to go home. When Thorazine first came onto the market, it was advertised as a chemical lobotomy. The idea that patients who may not have had much hope before could take a pill and be discharged from a hospital it was quite miraculous. Antipsychotics had serious side effects, but almost immediately reduced the need for mass institutionalization just as it reached its height. The height of the asylum population was about 1955. And at that point, I think 550,000 people were, were hospitalized. This was a major part of the fabric of society. You probably knew multiple people who had been hospitalized. The advent of pharmaceuticals fueled deinstitutionalization. But as patients left the asylum, they also left the institutional safety net Dix's moral treatment had provided. One of the things that we often overlook is how much agency patients themselves had about their lives in creating the world in which they lived. They formed relationships. They wrote institutional newspapers. They found forms of self-expression in an otherwise impoverished and brutal environment. Suddenly now, there is new hope for all, for you, the public, who pay the bills, and for us, the mentally sick. People with serious mental illness who are leaving psychiatric hospitals said to themselves, we need a place to go. No one really wants us. No one will employ us. Where can we go that's safe and actually rebuild our lives in some fashion, to whatever degree we can do that? Patients and advocates worked to build a patchwork system of locally based community care. Some leaders paid attention and looked for alternatives to institutionalization. When John F. Kennedy became president in 1961, he'd only recently learned about the disastrous outcome of his sister Rosemary's lobotomy. Kennedy himself had a strong, I think, his guilt and desire to improve the life of the mentally ill in the country. So help me God. Like Dorothea Dix more than a century before, he called for America to treat the mentally ill with greater compassion. The mentally ill and the mentally retarded need no longer be alien to our affections or beyond the help of our communities. Under this legislation, custodial mental institutions will be replaced by therapeutic centers. Congress passed the Community Mental Health Act of 1963 to fund the alternative programs patients and advocates had initiated. This was Kennedy's last legislative victory. He was assassinated three weeks later. I think that uh, years to come that those who've been engaged in this enterprise can feel the greatest source of pride and satisfaction and that they will recognize that there were not many things that they did during their time in office which had more lasting imprint on the well-being and happiness of more people. So I express all of our thanks to them and uh, I think it's a good job well done. In that speech, JFK saw a vision of the future where 50% of the population would no longer need to be hospitalized. The promise was great. It was an era of democratization. The patients were very much involved. We were not only going to be changing the world for the severely ill who were discharged, but we also had high hopes that we could help improve the whole mental health of the communities. Then, in 1965, President Johnson signed Medicaid into law to cover medical costs for low-income Americans. But psychiatric hospitals with more than 16 beds were not covered. One goal was to steer money into community care and away from asylums.
These castles, optimistically built to cure the mentally ill, hadn't fulfilled their promise, and opposition to them reached a crescendo. When were you admitted to the hospital? It was about five weeks ago. And who actually brought you to the hospital? My husband and six policemen oh, and three police cars. It began to be expressed that any form of involuntary hospital commitment was a crime of the state against individual liberty. And then came the Hollywood movie, One Flew Over the Cooker's Nest. Did Billy Bibbitt leave the grounds of the hospital, gentlemen? Which really portrayed psychiatry in an extremely negative light. I want an answer to my question. Yeah, as fools or villains or both. The film captivated America in 1975. The same year, the Supreme Court ruled the mentally ill could not be forcibly committed unless they posed a danger to self or other. There is no constitutional basis for confining such persons involuntarily if they are dangerous to no one and can live safely in freedom. This landmark victory allowed patients to refuse care, but in many ways backfired. institutionalization movement was driven by a true and beneficent progressive ideal for providing a better chance at life and health for people who had been locked away. To the extent that many of those people were freed and have gone on to live full and complete lives, right, those were really progressive developments. But this is difficult because to refuse care also puts the onus on you to care for yourself. And society has to figure out a way to deal with that. The 1970s brought new freedom for patients, but also a financial crisis that drove a conservative backlash against social programs. The history of American mental health care is a history of liberal, expansive projects to provide progressive care and recoiling against the costs and the nature of the social commitment. This dream of being treated in the community never came to fruition because the money did not follow the patients. You've got the federal government basically saying, we're going to close down a system that is pernicious and punitive and inhumane. But we're not going to make enough of a durable investment into communities. We'll continue to search for ways to cut the size of government and reduce the amount of federal spending. The Community Mental Health Act hits the rocks with the Reagan era conservative revolution which argues that you know government isn't the solution to your problem, government is the problem. He took the money that had been allocated specifically for the mental patients in the community and instead gave them to the states as a block grant, which the state could use for the mentally ill or use to reduce taxes or increase other programs and eventually to build prisons. We're going we're gonna to stop there, and we'll leave us there. And that, that kind of brings us up to some of the struggles that we are, we are having now with, com with uh, supporting community programming with uh, far, far less resources than was initially envisioned. Um, I, I'm going to fix my slides so that, you, so that we go back to the slides rather than the video. So hold on just a moment. There we are. And I'm going to actually highlight here some of the uh, good work that many of my uh, colleagues uh, that I see in the audience and um, very talented colleagues do and highlight some of the things that um, um, some of the places where Howard Center and our community partners come in. Um, so 
as I, as I was thinking about um, Andre and um, uh, some of the programs and supports that would assist him and other individuals um, in his uh, in similar situations, um, I want to highlight some of the some of our programs, um, particularly in adult mental health. So I'll elaborate on this in a little bit. Um, but as I was thinking about Andre and also thinking about um, the trajectory in mental health care in the United States that you just saw in the PBS documentary, um, it brought to mind the programs that we have in crisis, um, community support, counseling, um, employment support, and housing support that I, um, might support someone like Andre. I'm also going to highlight a few things that we already saw in the PBS um, film. So this is an image of President John F. Kennedy signing the Mental Retardation Facilities and Community Health Centers Construction Act. And as you heard, it turned out to actually be the last bill that he would sign. And um, under the 1963 law, he said custodial mental institutions would be replaced by community mental health centers, uh, thus allowing patients to live and get psychiatric care in their communities. And as you saw, because of multiple factors, including Reagan era shifts in priorities, far fewer of these resources were put toward community treatment than initially intended. And um, this is really, uh, we are still living in the shadow of these decisions and um, contributed to the shortage of mental health care that we still experience in, um, in our community and many other communities. I'm also going to highlight here the O'Connor v. Donaldson decision. This is the landmark decision of the United States Supreme Court. Um, it's a ruling that states that uh, a state cannot constitutionally confine a non-dangerous individual who's capable of surviving safely in freedom and caring for themselves, um, including caring for themselves with the help of family and friends. And this is really very broad language that has been interpreted in multiple different ways. And I wanted to uh, quote actually briefly directly from that decision. Um, so uh, the decision asks, May the state fence in the harmless mentally ill solely to save its citizens from exposure to those whose ways are different. And this is a, a bit of a, a summarization. Um, can the state hospitalize someone so they live more comfortably than they would in the community? And um, I, I, the decision answered this question. The answer is no. Um, they, they cannot. So what we've really seen is a shift to the community without robust resources. Uh, Deinstitutionalization shifted the burn, burden from, uh, from the person to prove sanity, um, O'Connor v. Donaldson, to the state to prove dangerousness. Um, but the shift didn't guarantee care, treatment, housing, work, acceptance, or community. And the result was arguably a transinstitutional shift to the prisons through the police and the courts. So this is a visual of that shift. And uh, this, uh, this visual shows the years 1963 to 2003. And um, I'm just going to highlight some things here. You can see that on the left-hand column, the black bar represents the number of people who experience serious mental illness living in psychiatric hospitals. And you can see on the right, which is 2003, um, the number of people who were residing in hospitals shrank dramatically. Um, you can also see the maroon bar is people who were unhoused. And you can see how that grew um, enormously in those 40 years. 
And I'll also highlight the red bar. That's the number of people who are incarcerated. And I'll, I'll just highlight here that one of the factors here was people going from hospital to prison, but it's not the only factor that we're seeing here. Um, another contributor was the sort of the broken windows theory of policing that was uh, that grew in the 1980s, which was the idea that in order to prevent larger crimes, police needed to crack down on low-level quality of life crimes. And that actually disproportionately affected people who experienced mental illness. So, for instance, a person acting erratically could be charged with disorderly conduct, or someone without access to a bathroom could be charged for public urination. So you saw people entering the prison system for essentially nuisance crimes um, who wouldn't have been uh, incarcerated prior. Um, and I just wanted to point out that the tough on crime rhetoric also helped enforce the persistent assumption that I, I think is still out there that people who experience mental illness are dangerous and need to be kept off the streets to protect the rest of us. Um, I, I think this is probably familiar to many of us, but I think it still is worth noting that people who experience mental illness are far, li far likelier to be victims of violence than perpetrators of violence. Um, so it's important to, to note that. And um, I, I, I think that we are successful in moving away from this dynamic in our community, but we've also seen that often uh, when police are first responders, that people who experience mental illness can end up in the criminal justice system and in, in the court system and incarcerated. Um, in terms of our local services, Howard Center services such as First Call for Chittenden County, community outreach, street outreach, and uh, the now under development um, mental health urgent care program address these issues of making sure that people who need mental health supports do not end up uh, in the criminal justice system and are appropriately supported with mental health care and supports. Oh. This is another visual that tells more or less the same story, uh, but a little differently. So the solid black line represents the number of U.S. adults who, um, per 100,000 who reside in an institution, meaning prison or psychiatric hospital. And uh, it, it is very tiny numbers, so I'll just highlight that this starts in 1928 and ends in, two, in the year 2000. Um, and you can see that the red dotted line represents um, people in psychiatric hospitals, or it says the mental hospital rate, and the black dotted line, the prison rate. And you can see the uh, drop in the mental hospital rate and the inverse growth in the prison rate. Um, and I, I've highlighted how that is multifactorial, but this is a really striking image that shows uh, essentially transinstitutionalization from hospitals to prisons. So I'm gonna take the opportunity to highlight some specific programs uh, at Howard Center that support individuals and support self-determination and individual uh, treatment choice. Um, And I, these programs also support people to stay in the community and out of hospitals and corrections. This is the same slide you saw earlier. Uh, this is not an, by any means an exhaustive list of Howard Center programs, but highlights some of the adult mental health programs. I wanted to highlight the community support program which serves Chittenden County adults 18 and older who experience uh, severe and persistent mental health challenges. In order to participate in this program, people need to meet specific eligibility requirements set by the state of Vermont. 
And this program helps people to recover and lead fulfilling lives. Most of my clinical work is, is uh, within this, this program. Community support program uh, supports people with case management, counseling, employment services, housing assistance and residential services, social and recreational opportunities, um, and psychiatric care. I wanted to highlight the ASSIST program, uh, which is a uh, crisis residential program. Um, you see my awkward red arrows in the back because that's ASSIST in the back. Um, that's actually next door in the front, but this was a better picture than I could find. So those awkward red arrows are actually pointing to, to ASSIST. And this is for adults who are experiencing a psychiatric crisis, um, people who are either, uh, um, uh, either avoid hospital care because they don't need that level of care, stepping down from hospital care. Um, I wanted, also wanted to highlight the START program, Stabilization, Treatment, and Recovery Team, uh, which is a community peer support team with uh, peer community recovery specialists. And first call for Chittenden County, serving people uh, in the community, regardless of age and diagnosis, um, through multiple different means, um, and providing crisis intervention assessments and referral to other kinds of uh, uh, care through those assessments. Um, and often collaborating with emergency responders as needed. And I'll give a reminder here that this does not take the place of emergency medical um, uh, care or assessment. Uh, and in a medical emergency, it's appropriate to call 911 just to, to give a delineation there. Um, and I'm going to move us back to Andre now, now that we have a background on um, how, uh, on the history and give, have a sense of how, how Andre got to where he is in a much broader sense. So initially, Andre's parents hoped that a new Washington State involuntary treatment law would help him uh, with a number of supports, help him get daily group therapy, housing and safety, medication. Uh, but they were really disappointed to find that that law was not yet in place. Um, so they, they pinned their hopes on a program focused on providing housing first, and if Andre got permanent housing with no strings attached, um, they hoped that outreach workers could build a rapport and gradually broach the subject of medication with him. And this approach known as housing first has emerged as a primary strategy for addressing homelessness in many American cities and actually um, across the globe. And the strength is to allow cities and mu municipalities to address things like tent encampments, without encroaching on individuals' civil liberties. And that was the path that was open to Andre. So Andre is now, he's at his hotel um, in Washington State, and the front desk calls him to say his caseworker has come to visit, and she has excellent news. The local housing authority has offered him a one bedroom um, at Central Park Place, which is a low income apartment building, which is on the grounds of the Vancouver Veterans Affairs Hospital. And um, the, the residents there are primarily veterans, but there are rooms set aside for people like Andre who experience mental illness, and the fee for rent is something that he can cover with his disability check, uh, $590 a month. So that placement solves several problems at once. He would no longer be at risk of freezing to death. Um, he's at much lower risk of ending up in the court system or of uh, frightening people around him and in his community. Um, it was also a triumph for the caseworkers working with him. Um, and for Andre, it meant that the pressure was off. He had a safe place to live that wasn't contingent on engaging in treatment and medications that he did not want. 
So he signed forms um, saying that he wouldn't punch walls, start fires, or smoke in the unit. Um, and beside other residents who were men in their 60s and 70s primarily, he seemed vigorous and charismatic. Um, and his apartment was tiny, but pristine, with a window, window overlooking the roadway. Um, so things were looking up for Andre, and he was housed on terms that he could agree with and felt, felt good about. So this is an image of Olga, Andre's mother, with uh, Andre and his twin, Sasha, before they uh, left Russia for the United States. Um, and Andre had been in his apartment for almost a month when the building manager spoke to Sam and Olga. Um, Andre was screaming during quiet hours. Some of the other men were afraid of him. When the manager knocked on the door, he didn't answer. He was losing weight and experiencing symptoms of psychosis. Um, he was avoiding food and had fears it was poisoned. And actually, his future was unclear. And that's where we leave Andre. Um, his future is, is unclear. So this sort of uh, begs the question, uh, when can the state of Vermont impose mental health treatment? Because if you imagine that Andre were in Vermont, uh, his parents would probably be asking that question and actually were asking that question. And I'll give a brief overview of involuntary hospitalization, involuntary medication, and mandated treatment in the community. And I'll just highlight here in Vermont um, the answer to the questions, when are some of the circumstances in which an individual can be compelled to treatment? Um, the brief answer is very, very narrow circumstances. And, for, and generally, though not always, for a very short period of time. So this is my very brief summary of uh, involuntary criteria for involuntary psychiatric admission. Um, a person uh, who has a mental illness and as a result of that mental illness, um, this is more of the practical um, uh, application, poses a danger of harm to themselves uh, or others. Um, and I'll, I'll add in, I, I brought some of the um, language of the law in a, in a broader summary here, and I'll add, also cannot meet their basic needs. Um, I'm going to leave this up here uh, and let you look at this briefly, um, because the, it's actually quite wordy, and I, I thought that I, I would just let you read that for a moment. This defines um, what danger of harm to self or others or inability to care for oneself um, is. So in practice, it is very hard to be hospitalized. It's very difficult to meet the criteria to be hospitalized involuntarily. And it is um, also very rigorously reassessed because I, um, Vermont takes very seriously depriving somebody of their liberty. And likewise, the criteria for involuntary medication is also very narrow. Under very narrow circumstances, in the course of an involuntary hospitalization, um, someone can, be, uh, can um, have court-ordered medication. Uh, the process is really lengthy, and people often wait a really long time, many weeks, before they receive medication. Um, it's also, well, 
it, it can also feel somewhat um, arbitrary. Um, it's actually, while the hospital petitions the court for involuntary medication, it's actually the judge that determines which medications and at what, and at what doses. Um, asterisk here, if you would like to view the statute, I'm very happy to send it to you. Um, we also have mandated community treatment in Vermont, and this is called an order of non-hospitalization. I can, I can tell you that I tried, I put this on a slide, I tried many ways to uh, describe it, and I thought, my goodness, I, I'm going to admit something here. I was in Vermont for many years working in mental health care before I really understood what an order of non-hospitalization was. Um, my kind, I had a kind colleague who worked at a designated agency before I did, and she probably explained it to me seven or eight times. So I am more than happy to share the official language, but I, I'm going to um, give my, my summary of what the, what the effect is, um, uh, though you may be able to grasp this far qu quicker than I did. Um, many states have some form of mandated community treatment. And um, this mandates adherence to mental health care, medications, housing, uh, when it's relevant, um, substance use testing. Um, I say theoretically because our version of mandated community treatment in Vermont uh, is not easy to enforce and is largely unenforced. Um, an order of non-hospitalization can be issued either by family court or by the criminal courts. Um, and theoretically, a non-adherent individual, meaning someone who uh, is under an order of non-hospitalization and doesn't do the things that they're supposed to do under that order, can be sent back to the hospital um, more rapidly um, and under different circumstances than if they were uh, if they were not under that order of non-hospitalization. Um, I, I think it's fair to say that they're really not enforced and meaningful only in very narrow circumstances. Um, the circumstances under which I've seen them be meaningful is if an individual uh, internalizes that order and says, okay, I'm supposed to do this thing, and that will change what I do because it's meaningful to me. And that's, that's pretty narrow. So what, what are the meaningful ways to reach people with support? And, and that's largely with voluntary support. And um, uh, sometimes it's practical support, seeing what people's uh, needs and goals are. And thinking about Andre, someday that's very practical support, um, food and housing. Um, and seeing what an individual's uh, goals are and how, how we can help support them in their own uh, goals and um, uh, immediate or long-term needs. Um, you've seen this slide several times by now. Uh, and and I, I, I'm thinking about also about Andre and how he, when he likely leaves his housing, may traverse um, his community and what some of the things that might be helpful for, for him are. Um, I think I've, I've talked a bit about our street and community outreach programs. Um, some of these folks are here and I just wanted to put a face uh, to the names and a shout out to my very talented colleagues. And something I've, we've not touched on too much but is really important is social connection and community. Um, and I'll highlight here Westview House, which is a day program for adults who um, have been diagnosed with a major mental illness. Um, it provides lunch and clients uh, often volunteer there and the people I work with often talk about what an uh, um, important um, work that is for them. And uh, work um, career connections, which supports individuals in the community support program with career counseling, job development, post-employment support and education and training. Um, so I will stop there. I want to thank everyone for your attention and um, really I just open up the floor for questions. Thank you so much. So
So we, we do need to have folks use the mic. So if anyone has any questions, if you can just come up here, that would be great. Bridget, if anyone has questions in the chat, you can step up too. Thank you, Simi, for that great presentation. Um, I do have one person, uh, Jackie, a former START peer support worker, has a question in the chat. Um, she, Jackie writes, I've recently heard more voices being raised that Vermont needs a larger state hospital again because it's better than being homeless with a mental illness. That is sad and scary. How do you answer that? So I would answer that by saying if Vermont needs more state hospital beds um, and more uh, room and um, room for more people for treatment at the state hospital, it's not uh, as a solution to housing insecurity and homelessness. Um, as we've uh, talked about, um, there, there are many, many other solutions to be for, for community housing, um, but for sure I would oppose that assertion. Thank you. Um, and then I guess building on that question, um, I was wondering, I, I know I did read the New York Times article about Andre and I saw it mentioned that other states are expanding their involuntary treatment laws. Could you talk a bit about what other states are doing and then more broadly, like what, what are the trends looking like in Vermont? Yeah, so the New York Times article highlighted, and I chose not to highlight this here because there's only so much room, that some other states are going in the direction of expanding involuntary treatment. Um, I don't think that's the direction that we're going in. Uh, and uh, as we can see, it's, there are not simple answers here. Um, and that involuntary treatment comes with a lot of uh, um, Problems. I think one of our strengths in Vermont is that we take um, people's individual autonomy and choice and liberty really seriously. Thank you. Anyone, anyone else? Any others on the, oh, come on up. Hello, um, I'm a social worker at uh, the Community Health Center, so uh, FQHC, and wondering about expand, um, access to the services. So I know assists cut their beds, um, and it's hard to get into CRT. And if you are, how, how can we increase access and delivery of services? That is an awesome question, and I think we can increase access to services by letting our, uh, letting our lawmakers know that we, we need um, resources for these services and to expand resources um, for uh, organization providing services that, like you've described. Um, so we're limited in what we can provide by the amount of resources and funding that we have. Um, and just a note, I, um, you will probably be pleased to hear that ASSIST uh, expanded the beds to, to six, so you may have an easier time, and I imagine you will, accessing those specific resources. So no longer combined with addiction? That's right. Hello, hello, cool. Thanks for that great talk. The history of it and the, the videos was, was great and really helpful. Uh, it left me with a question of what are your, or what's your number one go-to kind of institutional solution to, to the problem? Because what I got from that history is there was like the high point in about the 50s, let's say, and now it's gone to prison and community solutions. Is there a institutional solution at this point or is it pretty much, I don't know, not, I, not one to speak of? Uh, tell me if I could ask you to elaborate a little bit more on what you mean by an institutional solution? Yeah, I guess something like the mental hospitals, something like the asylums in 55, though we wouldn't call them that now. And maybe there's something new. 
You know, I wish I could summarize the, uh, a, a, um, one solution to this, um, these complex challenges. I really can't. Mm. And I thought a lot about that. Like if I, if I had to suggest one solution to this, um, but I, I really highlighted this to illustrate some of the complexities that, that we're dealing with. And I, I, I wish I could say that I had one solution that I think is, uh, would be um, effective um, and adequately address uh, individual choice and community uh, safety. And I, you know, I, I don't. Yeah. It's an excellent question. I, I think it, if you had the answer, it's a million dollar answer. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so in all of the things you mentioned that we do at Howard Center, you didn't mention our collaborative network approach. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are around collaborative network approach and just maybe if you could highlight that for folks to know that that is an alternative that's pretty positive. Thank you so much. And maybe I could call on you to talk a little bit about collaborative network approach and highlight that. I really, I really appreciate you bringing that up. So I'm not going to talk about it, but we do have um, an expert at Howard Center that can talk about that. I'm wondering if Leslie Nelson would do mind. I'm sorry to put you on the spot, Leslie. Sort of. <laughs> Thank you, Leslie. So in Vermont, there's a, a group of people that wanted to find other ways to respond to psychiatric crises, oftentimes psychosis, psychotic crises. And they've really borrowed, they've created a model called the Collaborative Network Approach that's really directly informed by open dialogue that was developed in Torneo, Finland. And it was developed in Torneo, Finland based on family therapy principles, and it was a complete reorganization of their mental health system in that catchment area. So it's very important to realize that CNA is not a treatment model, it's not a, a thing, it's really an effort to reorganize the mental health system and how we provide care. And some of the key elements are responding quickly within the first 24 hours, being flexible and mobile in how we provide treatment. So um, here we do go to people's homes, to facilitators, and do the work in home, and people really, really, really respect and respond well to that. And a key element that we don't talk about too much is that in Torneo, their research success really seems to demonstrate that by not using neuroleptics so heavily, especially at the beginning, leads to a better long-term result. So I know that can be like an iffy thing to talk about, but I think it's super, super important. So in Vermont, there's a state-level training that some of you have taken. It's a two-year training. Um, I'm one of the trainers, I'm happy to say, and we have active facilitators doing CNA work in the agency. I'm the point person. If you think you have a family and network that might want this type of service, just reach out to me and then I kind of negotiate the ifs, sins, or buts about it. And it's really designed to be a front door response, right? But we're just not integrated into, we haven't been able to take over the medical system quite yet. <laughs> I think that's sufficient. Yeah. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I have another question, um, another question in the chat. So, um, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing this person's name, uh, Is uh, Islan. Islan asks, um, or says that ASSIST is a good program, but only has six beds. Can we have more facilities like that in the community? Um, that, that, is a, that is a great question. And I think that prioritizing these kinds of programs when we don't, uh, meet the community when the capacity doesn't meet, meet the community need is really important. Um, that's a good thing for us to know, but also a good thing for um, uh, uh, our state state government and, and legislators to know as well that the, the need is, is broad. Thank you. I 
don't know if I, I no, sorry, uh, I, it's working, yeah. I, I don't know if I have a, a question per se, but but just to offer some other alternatives. Um, my, I'm uh, Chris, I um, run uh, two programs with Pathways Vermont. Um, our uh, Vermont State Support Line, which is a statewide um, support line that folks can call 24 seven. Um, and then also our uh, community center, which is here in uh, Burlington, um, that also provides peer support. Um, I think it's also good to know that we have a, a Soteria house here in Burlington, that's a five bed um, option, and we have another peer respite that's gonna be coming um, soon, that's, that's on the way. So we, we also have Soteria, uh, I'm sorry, Alyssum, which I'm also a, a co-chair of the board for that organization as well. So there's a lot of, of peer options that exist, I think, um, one of the things for me in, in this piece, like some of the, the language around mental illness, I know is definitely a topic that I very much struggle with, just this assumption um, that someone would be mentally ill or, or this, this label being put on people. I think from my, from my own experiences, um, I, I, the reason I credit not having been hospitalized, not having been, been institutionalized or, or even being on, on psych meds now is because I got access to peer support at a time where, where many people don't get access to that. So just being able to, to just, you know, uh, trying to ask for, for just those options to be considered and included as well. Yeah. Thank you yeah. so much. Thanks. Uh, so this question is from Jessica from uh, Champlain Toxicology Lab. Jessica asks, is drug testing a tool often utilized to monitor mental health medication compliance? Uh, I'm, I'm pondering the question. So is, uh, could you, is drug testing a tool often oh. used to monitor medication compliance? For um, mental health treatment. Mental health treatment compliance. I do not use that often. Um, I, in some, I, I've seen it used in some settings, um, particularly uh, sometimes in substance use treatment settings. Um, not, not, not often in my practice. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Simi. Um, in the slide you showed that had the correlation in hospitalizations and prisons, it seems as though there was a period of about 10 uh, years between 1970 and 1980 where there was a decrease markedly in both of those. Yeah. Was something happening in that point in our history? Was that just coincidence? Where um, it seemed like both uh, prison stays were down and, and hospital stays were down. Yeah, I think that uh, what you're talking about, we saw a huge explosion in the number of people who experienced um, housing insecurity and homelessness at that time. Okay. Okay. Um, but there may be other things you're thinking of, Matt. Is this something come, uh, come up for you specifically? No, it just looked like that might have been a stat significant period in our history. I didn't know, I didn't know if maybe there was like a great funding boom or there was some other thing happening at that time that was progressive. You know, it, uh, oh, I see. You know, I don't, I don't know. It's a great question. I, I know that we experienced more housing insecurity in that time, but there may have been other, other relevant things going on. And I noticed that, that too, and had a similar question. Great. Thank you. And I wonder if it's everybody leaving, it takes a little while to yeah. catch them in a new system. area, so you just have to imagine. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Um, so I actually, I, I remember when that New York Times article came out and I, I really enjoyed it. Um, at the end, um, the, the mother, I think, was the one who was kind of narrating it. And um, she was struck with this despair because in the end he decides to walk away from the apartment. Or it lo looks like it's pretty clear that that's what he's going to do. Um, and she made the point that, you know, he's so deep in his own reality that his choices aren't really meaningful because he's not making choices based on what's going on around him. Um, and, you know, I see out in the community the tension between the Supreme Court case where it says, you know, they can't live in the, in the community safely, which is fairly broad. 
Um, but in Vermont, we've really, really narrowed that. Yeah. Um, my cynical self says sometimes we've done that because treatment is expensive. Yeah. Um, and we don't want to spend the money on people who need treatment. Um, and I'm just wondering if you feel like there will ever be a time to try to move that so that, because like you said, it's extremely narrow. Yeah. To benefit a wider group of people, which I, I also I also appreciate that mandatory treatment isn't, involuntary treatment isn't always very helpful, but when a person isn't really able, isn't really making a meaningful choice, and you know that that's not a life that they would actually have chosen, yeah. um, it seems like, it, it just seems like it's not very client-centered, it yeah. seems like it's not very humane, it doesn't feel right. Um, and I, I don't know if you, it, I just wanted you to speak on if you think there's ever any chance that that might move to expand a little bit, or is this kind of where we are as a society right now? Do you have a, a sense of that? You know, I think Vermont is really different from our neighbors, and we are, I, in, in my observation, we prioritize an individual's choice over um, their their capacity to make the choice. So um, we individ we prioritize their choice regardless of whether you know we see that somebody has the capacity to look at the risks and benefits meaningfully. Um, and I, that was a real shock for me when I moved to Vermont about 10 years ago. Um, and I think it, it has the deficits that you've described, that if someone were uh, well or in a different state of mind, that, that, may, that they may make a very different decision for themselves. Um, I, I don't know if we'll change from that position. Um, I think, you know, for, I'm, I'm not a, a, a lawyer, I'm a physician. Um, but when I look at our involuntary treatment laws, they're, they're written in a way that could be interpreted in multiple different ways, but they're applied very narrowly. Um, so, you know, I, I, I don't know if we'll, we'll change. I can tell you I um, specifically on the uh, issue of capacity to agree to inpatient treatment, I've really advocated for looking rigorously at capacity. Um, uh, to make that decision, and uh, you know, I don't, I don't think that there's an enormous amount of sympathy for that right now. That's a, that the priority has been with allowing people to make a choice, even when they experience things that impair their ability to really um, look at the broad implications of those choices. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Anyone else? I just have to make a comment. <laughs> <laughs> I can shout out here, sorry. No, I, I think please come to the mic so everybody at home can hear too. I've got big boots on today. I don't think it's so much a question of yes, hospitalization, no hospitalization, expanding the opportunities to involuntarily hospitalize people as much as it's a question as showing the efficacy of treatment, inpatient treatment. It's not working. Mm -hmm. So we can keep putting people in the hospital for a week or two at a time, and they come out, and we know that actually that's a very high rate of suicide time mm -hmm. for people that first week exiting the hospital. So I think that has to be part of the conversation, is that may, there might be more support for involuntary hospitalization if the treatment worked. Yeah, that's fair, and brief hospitalizations don't, don't work that well. Yeah, for sure. Another question. For the folks who aren't legislature, legislators, Howard Center employees, uh, or just part of that network, what, what can be done, and maybe to narrow it down, I'm thinking of a specific instance where, it doesn't have to be this specific instance, but just to narrate it, uh, you're walking down Church Street, and someone's also walking down the street just screaming, clearly having some, having some problem. Is the right thing to do there, just do nothing and kind of take the, the Supreme Court approach where they're not being violent, so you know, let them do their thing? Or is, is there something that can be done there or should be done? 
Yeah, I think uh, the human, the right thing to do is the human thing to do and ask somebody how, the, how they're doing. Um, and, you know, keep, keep an eye on your own safety if you think that, uh, you know, that, that somebody does not, is not welcoming that approach, but the right thing to do is the human thing to do and ask your neighbor how, how they're doing and if they, they need something. Thanks. Yes. Someone else too, if you're not comfortable, and and let us know. You can call first call 24/7, and let them know we have street outreach's number, community outreach's number, and you can call and say I'm concerned about this person. Yeah, absolutely. You know, this is what I'm seeing. This is what I, but I don't know what to do. And we can talk to you and talk to you through what, what might be helpful. I'm going to repeat that for the folks at home. Thank you, Deanna. Sorry. You can all, no, no, no. Thank you. Um, you can also if uh, uh, call um, first call 24/7 to have somebody uh, assist that assist that person and assess the situation. So I think we've come to the end. Unless there's any last questions. Thank you, Dr. Rep. I felt super scared to uh, step up to the mic, but finally going up the bravery to do, do so. Um, Thank you for asking a question. I appreciate it. You're welcome. So uh, my name is Sean Zapolsky. I'm a self-advocate, and uh, I got a uh, um, I got a uh, page on this. I got a page on Instagram where. Uh, uh, I post um, not only like day in the life post, but also adv advocacy related content as well. Um, feel free to follow me. It's uh, the underscore awesome spelled A U S O M E underscore autistic. And uh, not entirely sure how relevant this question would be, but uh, um, so there are a lot of uh, individuals out there who are. Um, in their adult age and are also disabled and um, they also, you know, struggle to uh, stand up for themselves, especially, you know, when, you know, they're living with their legal guardians and, you know, you know, for some reason, you know, they're being abused and, uh, you know, how, uh, you know, foster care is like, you know, one of the purposes, the one of the purposes of foster care is to uh, um, maybe to, you know, protect, you um, children aged people you know from like a really hostile environment and uh, what are your thoughts on like doing the same for um, uh, um, <laughs> what are your thoughts on uh, like doing the same for uh, disabled adults um, who aren't really you know capable of you know you know defending themselves you know for some reason that particular situation you know foster care for uh, um, disabled adults, and uh, how well do you think that would pan out? So, actually, there are programs just like that. I think mm -hmm. that's a wonderful that's a wonderful question, and there are programs programs like that for adults who experience disabilities to live um, with families and and uh, supported by families in the community. So, um, it's it's a, a a great a great question. Um, and also something that is already uh, being done with a lot of success. Is there an, does that program have a name? I, I, I like to do some research on it. Is there a, maybe somebody else could fill me in with a broad name to describe that concept. Okay, I, that's what, I didn't know if there was a broader name to, okay, shared living providers, thank uh, you. I actually had a shared living provider myself. Okay. And, um, um, didn't know, you know, they could also, uh, you know, do that sort of thing too. That's good to know. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. You're a great speaker. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ravin. Thank you. Thanks to all of you for coming out. Thanks to our at home audience. And our next session is here on May 2nd substance use in our community. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.